everyone and welcome to AMC Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm Chris Lee Kennedy and this is the show that brings you the day's biggest movie news and of course we give you insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is AMC Movie News Senior Editor, Mr. John Campia. Greetings and salutations everybody. Welcome to the show coming to you from our Hollywood studio here at the Stream Studios in Hollywood, California. And I gotta tell you folks, my day has nowhere to go but up. I started my day realizing that I forgot to buy new deodorant yesterday, so I spent my time in glamorous Hollywood crawling around in the bathroom on my hands and knees rummaging through the garbage trying to find my old deodorant so I could scrape what little deodorant was left on it into my disgusting armpits. Hollywood! <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yes. We also have joining us AMC's production manager, Mr. Dennis Sen. Hey guys, uh, that's what we call John Ghetto Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the definition. <laughs> we also have director of the upcoming film, The Death of Superman Lives. What happened, Mr. John Schnapp? Oh, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> Insert donut here. All right, guys, recently on the set of his upcoming film, Fast and Furious 7 actor Vin Diesel made a video of himself practicing on a specialized set of stilts and confirming that he is indeed playing the character of Groot in the upcoming Marvel film, Guardians of the Galaxy, and that he was practicing playing a seven and a half foot tall tree. Diesel also reveals that in Guardians of the Galaxy, he will only have one line of dialogue in the entire movie. Schnepp, what do you make of Diesel's comments? Yeah, well, Vin Diesel jumping around, I, the footage just made me laugh. You know, I would do that too if I was on a set of another movie and I was just doing one line of dialogue. I'd be practicing even, I'm totally 3D, but look, I could jump around. They might never use this. I would just do that. I would do that, I swear. Yeah, yeah, he's like a little kid hopping around with a new toy, you know? He's like, he's just trying to show it off to everyone, oh, yeah. going up to people's trailers, hanging out and stuff. Uh, what's interesting is, is that in an interview about this, he talks about like this is not initially what he's he was talking to Marvel about. That there's something else that he's yes. gonna be doing for Marvel in twenty sixteen. He didn't say what it is, but that's actually the bigger thing. He's like, we're gonna merge the brands together. I don't I think he just you know, he's talking about himself, the Vin Diesel brand. Uh -huh. You know, like like Vin Diesel and Marvel are like here equal to each other and they're gonna merge, but I don't know. I, I'm more interested in seeing what happens with that. Well, I'll tell you, I love, 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 love Diesel's comments. And here's why I love them so much. Because I said from day one, when I realized they were going to have Groot, I was saying they damn well better keep Groot only with one line. I am Groot. That is all <laughs> Groot says. Now, actually, he says a lot of different things, but in his alien language, to our ears, it just sounds like I am Groot. But he could be reciting Shakespeare. So, and it's always, and you'd think that that would get tired after a while, but if you read the comic books or if you watch any of the animated stuff that Guardians of the Galaxy, the more and more Groot just says, I am Groot, the funnier and funnier it gets. So I, and I was really worried that when they said, oh, we might get Vin Diesel to do it, all that kind of crap, I was like, oh, please don't tell them they're gonna start giving Groot more lines and actually make him talk a lot. That would just ruin it for me. I am so very, very happy about this. I think this is great news. I can't believe none of you talked about how graceful he was on those stilts. Those things are so hard to he walk in. He was good, in. actually. So he looked graceful. pretty good on those yeah. stilts. Little hopping backwards, you know. Yeah, yeah. he looked pretty good. <laughs> Little bunny. As most of you know, Sons of Anarchy star Charlie Hunnam recently left the Fifty Shades of Grey movie. At the time, it was claimed that Hunnam left over scheduling issues and his busy TV schedule. Now, a Hollywood Reporter article is shedding new light on the breakup. According to the report, Hunnam began clashing with the creative team on Fifty Shades of Grey, including director Sam Taylor Johnson, over story issues and began asking for more control over the script, including submitting his own script notes, which were initially well received, but were then rejected as he submitted more. The struggle over creative control wasn't the only issue. The article also claims dealing with the negative backlash over Hunnam's casting was more stressful than he anticipated, even requiring Universal to hire extra bodyguards and protection for public events. John, what is your reaction to these new details on Hunnam's departure from Fifty Shades of Grey? Well, I mean, first of all, not surprising. I mean, we said on this show when they announced that Hunnam was stepping away due to very busy television. I, like, uh, my exact words were, how stupid do they think we are? This was not because of a scheduling problem. Uh, there was obviously more to it. Look, I, I, preface everything I'm about to say with this. I am a Charlie Hunnam fan. 
I'm a Charlie Hunnam fan today. I will still be a Charlie Hunnam fan tomorrow, okay? So let's get that straight. I'm also often very disillusioned with the celebrity worship we have. Like, it, 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 it really strikes me that no matter how obvious, when there's a conflict between the studio, who is, of course, the man, and an actor, a celebrity people love, no matter how obvious that it's the celebrity's fault, everybody wants to side with celebrity because we worship celebrities. I gotta tell you, as a Charlie Hunnam fan, I am really, really saddened to hear about this. Now, this is all assuming that this report from The Hollywood Reporter is correct, okay? So I'm going on that assumption right now. Maybe we'll find out later it's not, but assuming for the moment that the report is correct. Listen, in the words of The Rock, know your role and shut your mouth, all right? <laughs> Charlie, you're an actor. You don't walk onto a set and take control of the set and think you get to dictate what, especially an actor who hasn't established himself really. You got a great TV show, but so far you haven't really done anything in the movie business. To walk in there and tell the director what you want to have happen and tell the creative people what you want to have happen and think you're gonna to get to supply all the script notes and all, it's like this. It's like, Dennis, let's say these are my sunglasses, all right? Dennis is really terrified of what I'm gonna to do to his glasses. <laughs> and let's say I chip it here on the, on the side, right? I chip the sunglasses. I said, I need to hire somebody who can fix sunglasses. So I hire Dennis. Dennis is perfect for the job. And I say, now Dennis, if I'm gonna hire you, what I want is you to fix this chip in the, in the glasses. And Dennis says, okay. And I say, okay, great. And we enter into that contract together. And then two days later, Dennis comes back to me and says, hey, listen, I was thinking. How about we take out those lenses and what we do is we put in like bejeweled kind of bars on them and that we remove this one arm off the glasses and you hang it this way from your face instead of this way. I think that's the way to go. And I'd be like, well, well wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we talked about this before we entered into our arrangement that I would like you to just fix the chip in my glasses. He says, yeah, but now I have other ideas. Here's the thing. I understand if Charlie doesn't want to do this movie, that, that's fine. If he doesn't want to do it, that's cool. But decide you don't want to do it before you sign up to do it. And once you've signed up to do it, you saw the script before you agreed to be in it. You knew what the movie was going to be before you agreed to be in it. Don't agree to be in it and then walk into it and say, now I want to change everything. You're not going to do it the way I want? I'm leaving then. And that's the way it's coming across to me. You know, it's, it's, like the, it's like all the girls I knew in high school who started dating the bad boy because of what they thought they could turn him into. That's not what you do. That's what Hunnam did here. If this report is correct, I'm going to be a Hunnam fan tomorrow, but as of right now, I'm a really disappointed Hunnam fan. I'll get over it, but I think this is Bush League. I really, really do. Dennis, how do you see this? Well, I mean, now that I'm going to start my own, like, bejeweling, bedazzling <laughs> company. That's a new hashtag, glasses, exactly. by the way. Yes. I'd, like to, I'd like bejeweled glasses with just one eye. Yes. That's uh, what a copy can't be. It. But uh, I just want to talk more about uh, the other aspect of it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what the, the, you know, what the real facts are in terms of him wanting to change the script and how bad it was. And, yeah, he, doesn't, he isn't quite established enough to be able to do that. Um, but I think it's mainly the, the backlash, not from the Fifty Shades, because I don't think he cares about the Fifty Shades of Grey fans. It's from the Sons of Anarchy fans. I'm sure he got like so many yeah. emails and backlash about like, I'm not going to watch Sons of Anarchy anymore. I'm, I'm not going to be your fan anymore. If you go through with this, you're going to ruin everything. And I think he wasn't expecting that. And uh, I think he got scared. Schnapp? I don't know. I think Jax is awesome in Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> but I mean... <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey, I really didn't, I was like, you know, when that news came out that the scheduling conflict we talked about, yeah, that's not the truth. Now the truth comes out. I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's like he quit because of, you know, the insane backlash. Also, he probably was trying to flex a little bit too much and the studio pushed back. And then he was like, 125 grand? I think, I think he probably makes that a week on <laughs> per episode of Sons of Anarchy. So I think it's uh, all, you know, all said and done. It's probably, he was like, look, it's better if I step off now for whatever, you know, whatever that, you know, whether it was he, he was trying to change notes or, or just what, you know, the backlash, I think it's probably a smart move. Because, you know, I haven't read the book, I don't, you know, but I know a lot of people who have were like, Charlie Hunnam, so. See, the backlash I can understand because maybe that's what they weren't prepared for, and I get that part right. of it, but the other part of it was, look, when you agreed to be in the movie, you knew what the script was, you knew what the deal was, you knew you weren't the director, so deal with it. But anyway, Chris Lee, once again, out of the four people in this room, one of us is really looking forward to Fifty Shades of Grey, and that one is you. What do you make of Hunnam's comments? Well, it's either one of two things. Either Charlie is becoming a little bit more like Jax than I would like to believe, because then I'm super... <laughs> 
super disappointed in him in real life. Or the other thing I kept thinking is maybe the script's that bad that Charlie felt like he needed to fix it, which makes me really nervous. And I haven't been nervous about this yet. So this news actually makes me a lot more nervous than happy. All right. Well, listen, folks, we've reached that part of the show called Buy and Sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Chris Lee has a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down, and then Schnepp, Dennis, and I are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Chris Lee, what do we got? After a long battle and some significant nail biting over at Legendary Pictures, the Guillermo del Toro film Pacific Rim hit the $400 million mark at the worldwide box office. Results good enough to prompt del Toro and Pacific Rim. Rim writer Travis Beecham to start writing a script for a sequel. Del Toro has previously mentioned that a sequel would include Gypsy Danger 2.0, a Kaiju Jaeger hybrid, and the possibility that Charlie Day's character would become a villain. However, before we get too excited, Del Toro also points out that just because he and Beecham are working on a script doesn't mean the movie will get made and that the final decision will belong to Legendary. Schnepp, buy or sell a Pacific Rim 2. I totally buy that. I'm very excited. And true, I mean, just because they made a script order, that doesn't mean the movie's going to go. You know, those guys are now getting paid to write a script. But today, uh, Pacific Rim comes out on Blu-ray, so go ahead and buy it. I'm sure it's got all those extra scenes. If it's a big hit on Blu-ray and DVD, that once again will, you know, that's money that the studio sees as a possible make. Oh, we might as well move forward with Pacific Rim 2, because the movie's going to cost like $150, $200 million. So... I'm happy. I hope it get. I hope it happens. Dennis. Yeah, I, I buy this as well. I, I'm. Re I really love Pacific Rim, and I'm excited for a second one if they make one. Uh, I agree with with Schnepp in in that I think the Blu-rays are going to be the thing that that tips it over. I think a lot of people are going to buy the Blu-ray, and that's what's going to the studios are going to look at that and go, hmm, okay, I think we can make uh, more money, you know, out of the next one. Um, I'm going to sell it, but not sell that I would want to see Pacific Rim 2 because I very much would like to, but I, I sell that it was actually good, it's actually going to happen. I still think a lot of people, I'm going to disagree with you guys, I still think a lot of people overestimate in today's day and age how much money Blu-ray and DVD sales actually bring into studios because it's not like it was five years ago. Those sales have gone way down uh, because of streaming and, and a lot of other types of stuff like that. But I always said, Look, Pacific Rim is going to have to hit the $400 million mark, which I didn't think it was going to do. Yeah. It's going to have to hit the $400 million mark for Legendary or any studio to even consider doing a sequel because of how much it costs to make the film, to market the film, how much of that box office actually goes back to the studio, all that kind of stuff. And lo and behold, it did hit $400 million. Um, You know what? I'm not even sure that Del Toro is getting paid to write this script. I know on a lot of his his stuff, he just decides he's going to write it. And he'll go out and hire a writer sometimes. I don't know if that's the situation here or not, because you may be right. Maybe Legendary said, hey, go ahead and uh, whip one of them scripts together and we'll see what happens. Right. But uh, I think it's put itself in the, in the now in that realm. By making $407 million worldwide, it's positioned itself that it's possible. They could do one. I think they would have rather seen $500 million or whatever, $600 million, get into that Superman uh, or Man of Steel money area. Right. But uh, still, it's now it's possible, whereas before it wasn't. It's being reported that director Justin Kurzel's telling of William Shakespeare's period tragedy, Macbeth, has been picked up by the Weinstein Company. Michael Fassbender is attached to play the title role with Marion Cotillard playing Lady Macbeth. The new film will retain the play's 11th century setting and is said to use the original dialogue as well. The story follows the devious Macbeth, a Scottish lord who will stop at nothing to become king. John Byer sell Macbeth. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Uh, I buy this. I, I love Shakespearean stuff. Macbeth is not my favorite Shakespearean work, but it's still really cool. Uh, I love seeing modern retellings of it. And what a cast. My, uh, you know, Fassbender, Academy Award winner, Cotillard. This sounds really great to me. And using the original language, not doing a modern setting in New York City. What a, I, I like this, so I'm curious about it. For me, it's a buy, Dennis. Yeah, I buy it as well. Uh, I, I love the cast. Um, and it's interesting because there's always these William Shakespeare like uh, remakes of, of his plays and, and you know they, a lot of times things get lost in the shuffle but I mean there's a reason why because they're classics people know them by name and uh, thirdly most importantly they don't have to pay any royalties on, on these at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Macbeth versus Frankenstein. It's a royalty <laughs> battle. Um, 
I, I totally buy it. I, I'm excited. I love Shakespeare as well. I, I like the different, I like when they throw it like Coriolanus is like during the war from, you know, 1993 or whatever. It's like Richard III. It's like I like the change ups in history, but I'm also really excited to see a, a set in the actual days when it was written. And also Fassbender is an amazing actor, actor, Codelard, amazing actress. So, so I'm, I'm in. I'm more excited now for Macbeth versus Frankenstein. That, that's what got my attention now. All right, what's next? A new poster and trailer for the upcoming Liam Neeson action thriller Nonstop has just hit the web. During a transatlantic flight from New York City to London, U.S. Air Marshal Bill Marks, played by Neeson, receives, receives a series of cryptic text messages demanding that he instruct the government to transfer $150 million into an offshore account. Until he secures the money, a passenger on his flight will be killed every 20 minutes. Nonstop also stars Julianne Moore and hits AMC theaters on February 28th. Schnepp, buy or sell the new trailer for Nonstop. Sorry, I, I gotta sell it. I watched this trailer and just started <laughs> laughing about halfway through. Number one, it felt like snakes on a plane. Uh, it felt really cheap. It was like, hmm, how can we figure out a really, on a bus? No, wait, a plane. There's no, you know, it just felt like a cheap movie. What was the Wesley Snipes film, Always Bet on Black, when he says that line? Oh, uh, Passenger 57. 57. There we go, yeah. yeah. It just feels like a return to one of those, like, stinky 1980s movies. Uh, that I'm sure Liam uh, Neeson's getting a big fat paycheck, and he's a great actor, but it just, get the, the more I watched the, the trailer, the more I laughed. <laughs> and I just found it really silly. It's like, oh, I guess I guess the twist is he's the killer, or you know, or there's somebody who's like, I'm stowed away. I don't know what the ending will be. I'll wait for video. I'm just like, no way. You know, so, for me, uh, I'm I'm gonna sell this too. And this movie could actually, as I read it, this movie could end actually end up being really great. But the trailer hasn't sold me on it yet. It's just the first trailer. But yeah, it reminds me a lot of these confined spaces action thrillers. It starts with Die Hard, right? In this 50 story building, that's the confined space. Then it goes to Under Siege, so it gets a little bit smaller because it's on a battleship, not a 50 story building. Then it's Passenger 57. Like next is gonna be, I don't know, Sylvester Stallone trying to find an international terrorist on a rowboat. You see, like, these, <laughs> these, these confined spaces keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So the concept is interesting. Just from this one trailer, I'm not buying into the execution of it. So for now, at least, Anyway, it's a sell. Yeah, I'm going to sell it as well. It, it, it's like Liam Neeson is uh, starting to be kind of like Johnny Depp, where he's just doing this one role over and over and over again. <laughs> oh, we love him in that yeah. role. Uh, and also, yeah, the trailer wasn't that great. And man, if Julianne Moore ends up being the villain in it, I know, right? Like, because you're watching the trailer. Thanks for spoiling it for me. I didn't even think right. of that. Now, uh, <laughs> I haven't read it. I haven't read the script. I know nothing. I'm just right. watching that trailer. I'm like. Oh man, if she's the, the villain. Yeah. It's either her or Liam Neeson. You're yeah. like, it's one of those two, yeah. you know. The new official poster for the upcoming Sylvester Stallone Robert De Niro film Grudge Match is now available. Hitting AMC theaters on Christmas Day, the story revolves around retired boxers Billy the Kid McDonough and Henry Razor Sharp. Lifelong bitter rivals who are coaxed out of retirement and into the ring for one final grudge match. 50 years after their last title fight. John, buy or sell this new poster for Grudge, Grudge Match. I'm buying everything about this movie, and I really like the poster, too. It looks like the old-time fight poster. Got the little stars around the, the big, bold letters. I think this movie looks hilarious. I've loved the trailers. I was a little skeptical at first when I first heard the concept of it. But then the trailer sold me. I like the picture. I like everything I've been seeing about it. For me, it's a buy. Dennis? Yeah, I buy it as well. I, I, you know... I like the trailer. I think Kevin Hart is probably one of the funniest things oh, in that trailer. Um, but the poster itself, I, I like because it, it looks like the old classic boxing posters, which you know, boxing's a sport that's not, you know, it's it's kind of dying out now, and so. You know, who knows what the future of that sport is, but at least this is like the classic tale of the old boxers with a rivalry fighting each other. Yeah, sounds good, Schnepp. Yeah, I think they call pugilists, they think those are the little tiny dogs. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, I buy it 100%. I can't wait to see this movie. I might even see it on Christmas. You know, it's like, <laughs> but yeah, the poster's awesome. Um, this weekend, before we get into mailbag, I want to tell you about the special going on at AMC Theaters this weekend. If you have been looking forward to going see the new film Machete Kills, good news. This Saturday, you can get a free ticket with the purchase of a ticket. That's right, buy one, get one free. Now, in the show notes of this episode, I'm gonna put in a link where you can go and get all the details to take advantage of this offer. So if you're thinking about going to see Machete Kills, 
this Saturday is the time to do it. All right, folks, we reached a part of the show known as Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you would like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Now, every day, we pull a couple of questions out of the mailbag and address them on the show. Chris Lee's got a few of them pulled out. So, Chris Lee, what do we got? Kyle Kaiser writes, hey everyone, sometimes things just that happen just eat at me. This is one of them. Why do studios still hire M. Night Shyamalan? The last four movies he's directed have the following ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. After Earth, 11%. The Last Airbender, 6%. The Happening, 17%. And Lady in the Water, 24%. John, I know you always say that the first at fault is the director. How in the world does this guy keep getting a job? I know that he showed huge promise after six sense and signs, but it's pretty blatant he's a bust. Or am I wrong? And does he have nothing planned for the future because the studios took After Earth as the last straw? Thanks for the insight. You know, it. we are a culture of what have you done for me lately, and we <laughs> seem to have very short memories sometimes. I mean, look, I will get on the sham hammers case as much as anybody does, but in, and, I, and I think Lady in the Water is, is literally, without hyperbole, one of the worst motion pictures in the history of film. I think it's literally <laughs> that bad. Um, but having said that, let's not forget, it's not like Sh Sham was a one-hit wonder. You know, he gave us Sixth Sense, which is a great film, that, and that's rewatchable. Mm -hmm. Even though if you know the big ending, it's rewatchable. I really like Unbreakable. I know a lot of people, Unbreakable is, is their favorite film of the Sham Hammers. Not mine personally, but I really like Signs. I know a lot of people, now I didn't like the last five minutes sure. of Signs, like nobody did. The baseball bat stuff. <laughs> but overall, I thought the film was suspenseful and it was really well constructed. Yeah, not much of a payout at the end, but remember, he has made some damn good films. And yeah, he's made a couple in a row that have really not gonna, to the point that even when he did that last Will Smith movie, as Dennis often points out, they hid his name. Uh, what was it, After Earth? Yeah. yeah. After, Earth. After Earth, they hid his name off of all the promotion. After everything, right. they hid his name. They didn't even want people to know he was involved. But let's not forget, this guy still has talent. He's proven it. And I think the reason studios will sometimes take a chance on him is because it's like a sports analogy, right? Like, why would you bring that old football player out? He hasn't done anything in years. Because that general manager wants to be the guy to give that guy the shot again and to see him like, explode and do great. And I think there are studios who still believe that he's got talent and he could hit it out of the park. Would I do it? Would I hire him? No. But it's, he's done enough good stuff in our past that I don't really jump all over a studio if they want to take a chance on him. And look, when he makes a movie, I'm still going to cheer for him. I hope the next movie he does, I hope it's great because I don't like to have a bad time at the movies. So uh, for all those reasons and more, that's why he keeps getting a chance. I think he still will for a few more years anyway. Schnepp, what do you think? Yeah, I think when he makes his 11th movie, that's the one that's going to just like <laughs> home run. Bases loaded. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, he's he's had a he's you know a string of failures in the last like his last five movies. I would count the Village, I think it was called, right? Yeah, as well as like in that lump of failures. So, uh, descending order of you know. So uh, the only way to go is up, you know. <laughs> so sort of like hey, you hit, think you've been like you're like <laughs> skipping rocks, like oh after Earth, it's like you're gonna hit land soon. Last Airbender. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean he's all, he's a, a talented writer. He wrote She's All That. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, come on. You know, it's like... That's the end-all, be-all yeah, of I know. script writing. Man, that's a top notch. I just have to add that to the stack of my top There's 100. the Godfather. Yeah. And she's, she's all that. that. Right next to each other. It's like, a, you know, Robert De Niro. Sylvester <laughs> Stallone. Um, I, I say give him a couple more shots. I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't chuck $100 million at him. Right. But, you know, I mean, he's like, do, he was producing a couple of those horror movies. I think there was the Elevator one with a demon in it. That d Devil? Was that what yes. it was called? Yeah. yeah. You know, I say give the sham another shot. Right? <laughs> give the sham another shot, Dennis. <laughs> so unlike you, when I see M. Night Shyamalan movie coming up, I'm hoping it's terrible. I'm hoping it's <laughs> even worse than the one before. Because the last few that he's had are some of the worst movies in, in, in history. I mean, I, I did a review about Last Airbender, and I just tore it apart. I loved your review of Last it's, Airbender. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> now, that being said, the reason why they keep giving him a... Um, a shot is, we talked about this in a, a previous mailbag, about what do the studios care more about? Uh, the box office success or critics writing? It's the box office success because even though we think of all these failures, um, the only true, true like flop flop he had 
was Lady in the Water. Yeah. It, it only it cost seventy million to make. It only made seventy million worldwide. The happening made money. Uh, Last Airbender didn't make money, but didn't lose as much as people thought. Same with uh, After Earth. They all like I think After Earth was one hundred thirty million. Still made two hundred and forty or something worldwide. So that's why they keep giving him a chance because really he's only had one huge flop, right. and the rest, you know, they weren't successes, but they weren't um, to the studio. They weren't huge money losses. Are these mainly foreign markets? Yes. Yeah, a lot yeah, of them was foreign like, markets. Yeah, because it's all failures here in America. But then he, I saw an interview with him where he was saying, "Everyone in America hates me. They don't understand me. But I come to you know different countries." Other in other all other uh, no, they places hate him they there love too. Him. They do. <laughs> I think one of the but here's a really interesting thing about Shamhammer is that all these films that he's done, Last Airbender, The Village, um, well, uh, even uh, uh, The Happening, right? They all look great. Like when I, I remember Last Airbender, when I saw the trailers for it, I'm like, damn, son, right. this is gonna be good. And then it was what it was. <laughs> and then you know The Happening, I thought. Holy crap, people are like just dropping, dying, blah. This is gonna be amazing. Oh. People it, running away from trees. Yeah, it's the, like, wind. The, wind, yeah, the wind. The wind. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like, I mean it's one of those things where all the movies look amazing, so you know they're gonna draw an audience, but once they get there, they're like, oh, so it's not so uh, not so spectacular. His next movie should be called DOA. <laughs> <laughs> the life and times. All right, Chris Lee, what's next? David C. writes, Hello to the AMC movie crew. I am a faithful devotee to your show. Thanks, David. My question is about Guillermo del Toro, almost directing The Hobbit. Did he decide to step down from the director's chair to do Pacific Rim? I know he had been wanting to make it for a while, and both films went into production around roughly the same time. If so, do you think del Toro made the right choice, seeing as how The Hobbit did very well and Pacific Rim did not? I really enjoyed Pacific Rim, but I was even happier that Peter Jackson directed The Hobbit. Um, there, you gotta keep in mind, when The Hobbit was being, there was a lot of drama going around The Hobbit. By the time Del Toro left The Hobbit, The Hobbit was supposed to be done shooting. I mean, it, this, it wasn't like a two week delay or a three month delay. By the time Del Toro left, the movie was already supposed to be done. He moved to New Zealand with Peter Jackson. They lived there crafting the world of The Hobbit. He, there is so much of Guillermo del Toro in that movie. And I think you can see it too, in a lot of the visuals especially, that a lot of del Toro is still in that film. But as a director, you can only sit on your hands for so long waiting for the studio to finally say, okay, we're clear, go. And they, because they waited and they waited and they waited. And at some point, del Toro had to say, you know what? I've got obligations. I've got this, and yeah, Pacific Rim, I've got this thing lined up. I'm supposed to be shooting that. And if I don't go do it, everybody else who's been waiting to do it is gonna be sitting on their hands. At some point, he had to pull the trigger and go. I was really looking forward to seeing a Guillermo del Toro uh, incarnation of The Hobbit. I thought it would have been fascinating. But if he couldn't be there, then I was really happy that Peter Jackson was there to step in and fill it out. I think it was a win-win for everybody. But yeah, it wasn't, so del Toro, it's not like he, Huh, do I want to do The Hobbit or do I want to do Pacific Rim? He waited as long as he could as a professional. At some point, he had to move on. It's just the way it was. Nobody's fault. It's just the circumstances that they had. Schnepp, how do you see it? I think he was in development of the Mountains of Madness with Tom Cruise, and, and that was like why he had to leave, and then that fell apart. So he had a string of like... He had a lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of He's bad. always got a ton going yeah, at once. But like that period of time was like four years almost five years of him not doing anything because he moved to New Zealand. It was like deep in development on The Hobbit. He was like, I think he's still credited as screenwriter. Or I think he, he yeah. saw several Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. so, I mean, you know, I mean, if, if he did make it, we'd only get two Hobbits and we would have never gotten <laughs> a Pacific Rim. So it is a win-win situation, except I'm sure kind of like, if you were in that position, imagine how burned you'd feel. I just spent three years, I was gonna direct this and I have to scrimp off. Oh, you know, it was so, yeah, so frustrating I would have been. I'm, yeah, I'm sure it's a sad situation, you know, what, what came of it is, is is we do see those elements of del toro in the hobbit i'm sure you know and i'm glad that peter jackson is directing it instead of somebody else i'm yeah. glad it's like look man and it became three movies because it's like he just kept adding more appendices and you know that's it just the creative process bloomed from that i'm sure it was like let him do his thing i'll just help and then once he bailed he's like all right i'll jump in okay boom 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 you know it's like so i think it we we both all, all filmmakers win del toro sorry it happened you know it's like, that's all you can really say is like you know, it's a bummer to hear about that, but I don't think uh, 
Pacific Rim was the reason he left. I think it was a couple of other I think other it's safe to say that his schedule forced him to leave, whether yes. it was Pacific Rim, Mountain yeah. of Madness, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Dennis? Yeah, Pacific Rim just happened to be the movie that he did next yeah. after, you know, waiting for The Hobbit. And, you know, did he make the right choice? It kind of was like the only choice he yeah, had. Yeah, it was. He was, it? He yeah. was just sitting around and, like, you know, as, as a director working on something, you want to be shooting something. So. You know, he, he he didn't know when that was going to come. And then, you know, between, like, Pacific Rim and, and, and The Hobbit, you know, if Del Toro had done The Hobbit, it would have done, you know, well as well. And, yeah. it, 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 you know, if you had put Peter Jackson, hypothetically, in, in Pacific Rim, it probably wouldn't have done as well in the U.S., just like it didn't do well in the U.S. anyway. So I don't think, like... I don't know, like moving them around, it really made a difference in, in terms of like the financial success. Yeah, and I think very long before he left, I think Del Toro probably had a cutoff date. Because, you know, after he'd been waiting for a year, he had probably had to say, okay, I can wait until this date. Mm. I can wait until that date. But once that date comes, I've got too many other projects that are waiting for me. We have to be shooting by this date. And maybe it was six months away. Maybe it was a year away. But eventually they got to that date. And he had to say, you know what? Now it's out of my control. I got to walk. All right, folks. Well, listen, that will do it for us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Listen. Don't forget, there's a lot of great movies playing in AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com right now for all your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel already, do it now. Find that subscribe button and click on it. Become a subscriber to our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. It'll keep you up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news and, of course, our daily AMC Movie Talk Show and our weekend mailbag show. I want to thank, first of all, those people who are here with me at this table today, sitting to my immediate right, the production manager of AMC Movie News, Mr. Dennis Zen. Dennis, where can people find you online? Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter, at Think Hero, and chat with me on there. And right beside him, the director of the upcoming film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happens, which you could find the trailer for online right now, Mr. John Schnepp. John, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me at Twitter or Instagram, uh, at, just at John Schnepp. And, of course, our lovely host sitting over there in her own little secluded cage, Miss <laughs> Chrisley Kennedy. Chrisley, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, at Chrisley. And you can find me on the various social networks, just at John Campia. Thank you so much for joining us today, folks. Don't forget, the most important part of the show is not what we have to say. It's what you have to say. Make sure you jump on down to the comments section below and leave your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discuss here today. Agree, disagree, the most fun part about being a film fan. Thanks a lot for joining us. Until next time, I'm John Campia for AMC Movie News. Bye-bye. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe to AMC Movie News on YouTube. It's free and a great way to stay updated with all the latest movie news and check out our daily show, AMC Movie Talk. Also, don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter to stay in the loop for our special prizes, giveaways, and contests.